Transformation. That's what God is all about. God is in the transforming business. And, you know, unless we're transformed, we cannot be used by the Lord. And, you yeah, know, there's a lot of people who have walked aisles or said a quick prayer. You know, the sinner's prayer that we like to call it. To ask Jesus to save their, their soul, to save their life. And yet, they have never allowed the Lord to transform them. They have never experienced the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Today, the name of the message is called Transformed by the Spirit of Jesus. And we're going to read Romans 12, verse 2, and 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. To start. It says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, Lord God, we come to you today and we welcome you here. Father God, we ask that you would speak your word. We ask that you would do what needs to be done in this place. Lord God, let me be your mouthpiece. Lord, take control of my tongue. Lord, let every word that comes out of my mouth, let it be your words and only your words. God, I ask that you would help me to be invisible, that you would be seen. Lord, I pray that every heart and mind would, would be ready to get what you want each person to receive. And I thank you for transformed lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, just want to make sure we got the CD recording today. Okay. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our mind? The Word of God. You can't renew your mind by spending all your time Scrolling through Facebook. You can't have your mind re renewed. Watching TV all the time. Gun smoke, even though sometimes they have references to God on, on some of these old shows, and I love them dearly. They're wholesome, usually they're good shows. It will not renew your mind. The only way that you can have your mind renewed is through the Word of God. As we open our heart to the Spirit of Christ, as we meditate on the Word, then we are being transformed. How are we being transformed? Paul writes, by the renewing of our mind. And he, he adds something there at the end. You know, so many times I have people tell me, I just wish I knew what God's will is for my life. I just wish I could hear God's voice. One way God speaks to us is through His Word. He also speaks to us by His small, still voice. Through the Holy Spirit. So it says as, as we how are we as we are conformed as we are transformed 
as we are transformed by renewing our mind, it says then, then we will be able to test and approve what God's will is. So what's he saying? As we renew our mind, as we are being transformed more and more into the image of Christ through the Word of God, then we will know. Look at your neighbor today and say, you'll know. God wants you to know. What does God want you to know, Trevor? God wants you to know His will, His good and pleasing and just His permissive will. Is that what it says? Your God has a permissive will. Do you know He gives us a choice? We can choose to follow the path of the Lord or we can choose to go out and make our own decisions and do what we think is right in ourselves and based on what other people say is right. God doesn't want you today just to know His permissive will. God wants you to know His perfect will. Do you know the perfect will of God will line your life up with the way He created your life to be? Who do you think knows what's best for you? Do you think, do you think uh, WSOC knows what's best for you? Do you think your neighbor down the street that's not even in church and not serving the Lord, do you think they know what God's best, His perfect will is for you? Who do you think knows the perfect will of God for your life? God. Why does God know the perfect will that He has for your life? Because God created you. I'm here to declare today that you did not evolve from some monkey. Although some people make that argument hard to to do. (laughs) You were not evolved from an ape. I'll tell you why I know that. Because God is not a monkey. And he says that he created us in his image. He created man in his image. And woman was taken from a rib of a man, so you are also created in God's image. So God wants you to know his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Look at your neighbor and say, the perfect will of God is best. Do you know if I had followed the perfect will of God in every area of my life, I could have avoided a lot of pitfalls. I could have avoided a lot of heartache. God intends for the road to be straight. But when we follow our own will, then we look like we're, on, we're going around some mountain or we're on Stony Gap Road or Valley Drive and we're going around all these turns and stuff and And then God has to try to take his shepherd hook and he has to try to hook us and he has to pull us back on his straight road. I'm here to tell you today, God will provide for you if you will listen to the small, still voice of the Lord and you will follow his straight and perfect road for your life. Jesus said, consider the sparrows. They don't... They don't go out and they don't have to plow fields and do all this stuff. And God takes care of them. That's my paraphrase. God says that He knows what you need even before you ask Him. He's got some conditions in here. He wants us to follow His Word. He wants us to be obedient. He wants us to bring the first fruits to the storehouse to the church and give to so that there's food in his house but do you know that that when we live in obedience to the Lord he is faithful so God wants us to be renewed he wants to transform us as we renew our mind Second Corinthians says that we are being transformed 
2 Corinthians 3.18 says, As we with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. Why do we have why can we go to the Lord with unveiled faces? Because when Jesus Christ died on the cross, it said there used to be a veil. There used to be a curtain that separated the ordinary people from the Holy of Holies. It separated them from the presence of Almighty God. But when Jesus died as the veil, he died you know, as the as the Mediator, he died in your place. But when Jesus died on that cross, that veil was rent from top to bottom. When his body was torn and broken for you, that veil was torn. And the way into the Holy of Holies, the way into the presence of Almighty God was opened up for you. So that you can go in. You can go in boldly. You don't have to be ashamed. If you've come under the blood of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. And you can go boldly to the throne of grace. And you can present your request before a holy God and be accepted. But it's as we go into the Holy of Holies, as we focus on Jesus Christ, do you know that the more you focus on Jesus, the more you begin to reflect the glory of God? Do you know why so many people that claim to be believers in Christ, do you know why they look more like the world than they do Jesus is because their focus is set more on the things of this world. The focus is set more on themselves and their wants and desires than it is on seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And the more we focus on Christ, the more we enter into His presence, the more we begin to be transformed from glory to glory. And the more we began to desire the things that God wants for us apart from the things we desired previously. So, and we, with all, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory as we focus on the Lord, we're being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory. What does it mean for something to be ever increasing? What's it mean for something to to keep increasing? What does that mean? Come on, talk to me. Does that mean that it's, it's going away and there's not much of it? If something's ever increasing, what does that mean? You're getting more of it. That's right. Thank you, Michael. God wants to give us more of His glory. I know there's a commercial for a lawyer where you got this woman called Miss Moore and she's always wanting more, 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 more. That's the attitude of the world. You know, always wanting more, more stuff to gratify the flesh. But if you are desiring to have more of the presence of God in your life, I promise you this, If you will seek first the kingdom of God, if you will focus on Jesus and meditate on His Word and open your heart to be filled with His Holy Spirit, I promise you this, you will never ever be the same. So what does transform mean? I know they had toys. They had a a show called Transformers. They made toys based on that. But what does, it, what does it mean to be transformed? Totally change. Michael, you going to add something? You say changed into something else? Is that what you... Changed to be more like God? Is that what you said? Amen, brother. Amen, So to be changed, transformed is to be changed. I looked up the meaning of of change. And this is what Webster says. To be changed is to make different in some particular way. It means to alter it. Another meaning is to make radically different. 
or to transform. Radically different. Being changed by Jesus is meant to make us radically different. What's it mean to be radical? What? Sold out. To be radical means you are all in. To be radical means the world's going to look at you and think, man, you have flipped. What is wrong with you? But to be radical means you are all in. You're going with everything you've got, everything that you're about. You're focused and you're, you're doing something about this particular thing or whatever you're, you're radical about. So to make radically different or to transform. It also says to give a different position, course, or direction. To be saved means that we go in a different direction from what we were going in before. Do you know that when we're lost, we're heading, we're on a bobsled to hell? I saw, I saw a cartoon. Kind of made me a little tickled today. I mean, we know that, that hell is fire and brimstone. Hell is the flame. The worm does not die. The flame never is, goes out. You know, it's constant torment. But I saw a meme where it said, where the devil was telling somebody that came down there, said, oh, we... You know, we, we took the flames out and we put Legos all over the floor. <laughs> that was just a little joke. It's still flaming and it's still burning. But if you've ever ste- stepped on a Lego piece, man, it, 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 it don't forgive. It hurts. But to change position, to change to change position, to change course from a course of going to he- of heading straight for hell to a course of heading for our inheritance. Do you know that God has an inheritance for you and it's called the kingdom of God? Do you know that you don't just have to wait until Jesus comes back and calls you home? To enjoy the kingdom of God. Do you know Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you? Wow. Think about that. God wants to transform you. He wants to change you. How does He change you? He changes you. By replacing the spirit of the world in you, that's another definition to replace with another, a definition of change, or to make a shift from one to another. God wants to transform you. He wants to shift you and your direction. and He wants to, to replace the spirit of the world in you with the spirit of Christ. And do you know something? The spirit of Jesus... Does the Spirit of Jesus, is it meant to be sent out so you can live the same way you were before? No. Is the Spirit of Jesus sent to us so that we still have to go out and do everything by self-effort? No. The Spirit of Jesus is sent to us. The Holy Spirit is sent to you as a believer so that you are totally transformed. You are changed. You are enabled. The Holy Holy Spirit is the enabler through His grace. You are enabled. The Holy Spirit is sent out to you to transform you and to enable. What does it mean to be enabled? Given the ability to. To be enabled is to be given the ability to do what you could not do. I promise you this, Brother Steve, I love you dearly, but in yourself you'll never be able to please God, just as I can't please God in myself. Jeremy, in in yourself you'll never be able to please God, only in Christ, only through the Spirit of transformation, only through the Holy Spirit of Jesus can we ever please the Lord. Look at your neighbor today and say, it's about his power, not yours. 
It's all about the power of Jesus. It's all about the spirit of change. Do you know the Holy Spirit is the spirit of change? The Holy Spirit is the spirit of transformation. In uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 8, Apostle Paul wrote these words. Ephesians 5 verse 18, excuse me. It says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled. I'm going to stop right there for one second. It says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. It leads to to trouble. It leads to a bunch of mess. But it said, does it say to be emptied? Does it say to be, does it say just to have a little bit? What's it say? It says instead be what? Instead, it says, it says instead be filled. Does it say be filled with the spirit of this world? Does it say be filled with, with all the cares of this life? No. It says be filled with what? Be filled with the Spirit. Whose Spirit? The Spirit of the world? No. Apart from Christ, we're all filled with the Spirit of this world. Spirit of Satan. It says be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit. The Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit, church? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Jesus said these words in Acts 1, verse 5. Jesus said, For John baptized with water, but in a few days we will be baptized with the what? We will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of people that on Friday and Saturday night, sometimes not even, they don't wait till the end, that they try to be filled with the Spirit. But it's not the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of, that comes out of a bottle or Spirit that comes out of a, a can or, or something. But those, that type of Spirit will only lead you to trouble and disaster. But Jesus said... He came to baptize us or to fill us with His Holy Spirit. Look at your neighbor and say, The Lord wants you to be filled with the Spirit. Jesus said these words in Matthew 9, verses 16 and 17. Jesus said, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do they do people pour new wine into old wineskins. For if they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved new wineskins Jesus came did Jesus come to leave us the same yet there's a lot of people that call themselves that say they belong to Christ that there's no change in their life they're still doing still living the same way they always have they're still feeding on the world Instead of Christ. Jesus. Jesus came. To bring change. Jesus came. To transform. Jesus used that illustration. That you can't pour. 
new wine into an old garment. Jesus said you couldn't just patch and a piece of cloth that had not shrunk. You couldn't put it on an old garment. In other words, you can't come to Jesus and just try to stick a patch on your old life. <laughs> if you come to Jesus and you just try to have a, a new patch put on your old life, it's not going to hold. You can't just take a patch. Jesus Christ is not just a patch to be slapped on your old life and leave you the same. You have to have you have to have a new a new wine skin. You have to have a new container, a new vest, a new you have to have something new to hold what God wants to give you. In other words, you can't just say, Lord, I, I just want a little bit of you. And that'll be enough. The early disciples. If you read the story of the early disciples, the, the apostles in the in the Bible, and the and even the martyrs that that are in the uh, the the history that was recorded that's not part of the Bible because it wasn't inspired by God, but yet it was. It's the Ant, Antine prophets or fathers. It's, it's a history, it's a book that, that's available that you can read to find out about what went on during the time and the history when the Bible was written with the people. But if you look and see the way they lived and you see the radical change in their life, I have been, I've got some friends in India and my heart is really bleeding for them right now. They're in uh, Miramar or Manipur. And I probably didn't say it right. They're in Manipur, India. I had the privilege of teaching online for, the, for a Pastor Shanglin Merrim's Bible school two or three times last year. I was supposed to do it again this year. But in that country, things have gotten stirred up. I was talking to some Indian friends yesterday who were at the uh, Acts 2 journey. They've got Indian churches in Charlotte. And they were. I was at, talking to them, and they said, "In India, you've got one part that's Christian, you got one part that's you know, primarily Hindu, and in around Manipur and, and that part, there's heavy persecution." I lost contact with Shanglin, and he finally was able to get to an area where he could send out a message. And he said, "Please pray for us." He said they have, you know, stirred up persecution. They've cut off contact through internet and everything with the outside world they are burning churches they're even seeking out Christians and pastors to kill them before that he told me that the river was dry they were having to dig in the mud and to try to find water he said the price of, of the things they need to live has gone so high they're having trouble finding it these believers you look all through the Word of God and you look at the believers in the other parts of the world, they don't just come when it's convenient to Jesus. They don't just come to, to say, Lord, I just want a little patch stuck on my life so that I'll feel better about it. I just want my ticket to heaven and that's enough. They make a complete and total commitment to Christ. I'm here to declare to you today, church, that coming to Jesus is about making a total and complete commitment to Him and His kingdom. I'm here to tell you today that if there is not a transformation in your life, then something is wrong and you need to fall on your face before a holy God and say, God, help me. God, change me. I'm not, I can't live like this. I know, Lord, that your word says that you came to transform me, that you came to change everything about me that's not like you. And so, Lord, I ask you to change me. 
if you try to pour the new wine, the, the wine of the Spirit of God in your life, and you don't allow the Holy Spirit to change you, to transform you, then it's, you're not going to be able to contain the new wine. When wine is made, when wine is made during the fer uh, fermentation process, they take the grapes and everything, they put them, they put them up, they put them in a, a wine skin or, or a bottle or whatever they do, and there are yeast in the, that's in there to make the change. If you've ever made bread and you want it to rise, you put yeast in it. And so it rises and it's fluffy and it's really good and delicious. Well, to make wine... The wine during the fermenting process it has yeast that released uh, carbon dioxide and, and stuff. And, and it does this transformation. It takes some time. And it changes it from the form it was in into, an, into a, a wine. And, but there's stretching. There's moving. There's, you know, it's it's got to breathe. And that's why you can't receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus in a life that has not changed. Because your body has to be able, you have to be able to be transformed into what Christ wants you to be. So, you know, you don't pour new wine into old wineskins because it won't hold it. You pour new wine into new wine skins, and both are preserved. Jesus said these words in in Matthew eighteen and verse three. Jesus said, "Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven." Did Jesus say, come on to me, I'll throw a patch on your life, and you'll be good to go? Is that what he said? No. Jesus said that if we are to come to him, we have to change and become like little children. Do you know a little child has to depend on, on a parent or a caregiver to give the child what it needs. A child is constantly adapting and changing as, as the environment and as you know, the parents or the caregivers tries to shape their lives. And Jesus said, unless we come as a little child, a little child comes trusting. A little child is willing to learn and to grow. And he said, unless we come and change and become like a little child, we will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 13 and verse 33. Yeah, I read the story, I, re I talked to you about how wine has yeast, or grapes, when they make wine, there's yeast in there that changes the grape juice and everything into alcohol. Well, in Matthew 13, 33, Jesus told this parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. The Holy Spirit is yeast. There's another kind of yeast Jesus told us to stay away from, which is the yeast of the world. You know, the yeast of the Pharisees that comes in and pollutes everything. But there's also the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God works like yeast to stretch and to grow and to change us. And so just as yeast causes that dough to rise into a, a delicious uh, loaf of bread, God wants His Spirit to be the yeast that stretches and changes you to make you into what He created you to be. Look at your neighbor and say, God created you to be beautiful. God created you to be transformed into to His image, the image of Christ. 
But what about today? What about the Holy Spirit today? Was the Holy Spirit just for, for when Jesus came and when the apostles walked to earth? Was it just for that time and now God says, well, go out and do it yourself? What about today? What does the Holy Spirit mean for us today? Acts 2. So we've been going through the Acts 2 journey, some of us. But Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Can you imagine that? I know that's not a very good wind. Can you imagine? Mighty wind. Mighty wind. Like the wind of a tsunami. A wind from a, a mighty hurricane. Even greater. A mighty rushing wind. Woo! I know that's a lousy wind, but I'm just trying to get the effects today. A wind, a mighty, the Holy Spirit came like a violent, woo! Violent rushing wind. The Holy Spirit came blowing th- from heaven. And does it say that it just came and just hit little spots in the house? What? Does it say the Holy Spirit came like a mighty wind and then it just dropped little, little, little pot deposits of the Holy Spirit in certain places of the house? Is that what it says, church? It says the Holy Spirit came like a mighty violent woo, woo, blowing wind. And it came from heaven and it filled not just one corner and then another corner. It did fill one corner and another corner, but it didn't stop there. It came and it filled the whole house. Does it say the Holy Spirit just hit one or two people? And said, that's enough. We're done. And all throughout the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come on on the prophets of God so that they could, for a time, so that they could fulfill the call that God had placed on their life, the specific purpose that God had put them there for. But on the day of Pentecost, things were different. On the day of Pentecost, a violent rushing wind came from heaven. It filled the whole house everywhere that people were sitting. And then it says in verse 3, it says they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. Tongues of fire. Man, I can't, it's hard for me to fathom what a tongue of fire looks like. I mean, I picture a flame sitting on their heads, you know. But it wasn't just a flame. It says that the tongues of fire separated, became more than one. Just like when Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fish. The flames of fire came down from heaven with mighty rushing wind and separated and didn't just rest. Does it say it rested on one person and not another? Come on, come on, talk to me. It says the tongues of fire came and separated. And it says it came and rested on each. What's it mean, each? Each means it says it rests on each of them. So does that mean it picked and chose who it rested on? If it says it rested on each, what's that mean? All of them. 
You mean the Holy Spirit is for each and every believer? Do you, you mean the Holy Spirit is for every person who will come and believe? Every person who opens their heart and says, Look, Jesus, I'm not happy. I want you. I want all of you. I want your power in my life. What's it mean? If it came to rest on each of them, that means the Holy Spirit is for who? Holler that out, Michael. All of us. The Holy Spirit is for all of us, just as it was for all of them. And it says that it rested on each of them. And verse 4 says, all of them were filled with were they filled with the spirit of the world? They already had the spirit of the world before God was changing them. It says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit again? Spirit of Jesus. Spirit of God. Spirit of Jesus. And it says they were filled with the Spirit of Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The Holy Spirit was bringing a new language out. If I, read the, if I read through the rest of that passage, it would say that people, no matter what their background were, they heard them praising God in their individual languages. We're talking people that could not speak the languages of some of the other people God brought His praises out of their mouth in languages they could understand so that all the people, no matter what language they spoke, they knew that something was going on. They knew that this was a God thing. I mean, some of them, some of them did say that they thought they were drunk because they didn't understand. But listen to this. Brother Peter stood up Verse 14, chapter Acts 2, verse 14, says that Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Peter, the one who had denied Jesus three times previously, suddenly had a boldness on him that he had never had. And he began to declare the word of God. Listen to this. Peter said, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you listen carefully to what I say he said these people are not drunk as you suppose it's only nine in the morning no this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days God says I will pour out my spirit on all people your sons and daughters will prophesy your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on oh my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Wow. What was it the prophet Joel said? Is, is time ended? Has everything come to a close? Is, is, is time ended? Has the last days ended? Talk to me. Have the last days ended? Is the world over? What? No, we're still living. We're still going... We're still going about our life. So, no, the world has not ended yet. So, so the prophet Joel prophesied. He said, in the last days. Right now, since Jesus has not returned, since, since things have not been put, brought to a close, we are still living in the last days. And Jesus said, or it, was, it was told through the prophet Joel, says, in the last days, God says, I will pour my spirit, I will pour out my spirit on, does he say just a few people? What? He said, all people. 
That means he will pour his spirit out on the Chinese. He'll pour his spirit out on the Indian, the Indian people. He will pour his spirit out, spirit out on the uh, Arabic people. He will pour his spirit out on the African people. He will pour his spirit on all flesh, every person who will receive him. When it says all, what's that mean? It means everybody. No one who, who desires the Spirit of Christ is excluded. So in the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Does He pour it out just for, for boys or girls or men or men? Does He pour it out just for men? No, He says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. He said, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions your old men will dream dreams. He says this in verse 18. Even on my servants. He doesn't say just on men. He doesn't say just on women. He says both men and women. I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. The spirit of change. The spirit of transformation. The spirit of power. The spirit of boldness. God has sent His Spirit. Jesus Christ came. He lived. He bled. He died. He ascended. Jesus Christ ascended back to the right hand of Almighty God. Jesus is seated at the power side of God. Because Jesus is seated at the right hand of God... He said, I will send my spirit. He said, I will baptize you in my Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is the right hand of the Father, He is saying today, I want you to experience my Holy Spirit. He said, I don't want you to go through life weak and puny. I don't want you to be living as a yo-yo up and down. I don't want you to be living frustrated because you can't do it yourself. I want you to know the power of my Holy Spirit to come in and transform you. And enable you. He said, I want to... I transform you I want to change everything that's causing destruction in your life and I want to make you beautiful I want to I want you to be clean and pure before me I want you to be able to enter into my presence and behold my glory I want to pour my spirit out on you whether you're male or female whether you're you're young or old I want to pour my spirit out on you. Transformation. Are you ready for a complete and total transformation by the Holy Spirit? Do you desire everything God has for you? Maybe you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Maybe you've asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, and that's the beginning. But Jesus wants to be everything. To be Lord means to be, that He is everything in you, to you. He wants to be the driving force in your life. Our, uh, you know, we like to drive Volkswagen diesels, and they, they put a turbo in them in the, the last several years that they made them so that they would have some power because without the turbo they were pretty weak. That turbo gives that diesel engine the kick that it needs to accelerate and to, to bring, get the speed that's needed for you to, for us to drive and pass cars. And you could, I think that car would, it says 160 on the speedometer, and I wouldn't be surprised that it wouldn't do it. But what I'm saying today is don't live your life with a three horsepower lawnmower engine as the driving force of your life when God intends to put a turbo in you a big turbo that turbo is his Holy Spirit the turbo is the game changer the Holy Spirit is the game changer in your life and today as we end this service we're going to end I want us to end worshiping the Lord 
with just something, just kind of a, a, a real worship, soft music. But I want us to enter the Lord, the presence of the Lord. And today, if you want more of Jesus, if you feel like you're lacking the power that God wants you to have in your life, that He says He will give you, and you say, Lord, I'm tired of fighting, I'm tired of struggling, I can't do this in my, on my own. Lord, I recognize that, I, that change has to happen, and I can't do the change. Only your Holy Spirit in me can change me as I yield to you. Today, I want to give you the opportunity. This altar is open, and if you desire more, of the Holy Spirit I don't care how long you've walked with Jesus if you realize hey I've got to have more I want to be changed I want to be more like Jesus then I want to challenge you to come to the front and be willing to change directions be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to come in you when you come I want you to I want your heart's cry to be Lord I want everything you have for me Jesus you know, if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior of your life, ask Him to save you. But, but don't just ask Him to save you. Ask Him to fill you with the Spirit and change you. And today I want to invite you as we, we end this service and worship, I want to invite you to come. And let's ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill us up. If you just need a fresh infilling of the Spirit, I want to invite you to come and say, Lord, I need more. And, and I'm going to tell you, that should go out to everybody. If you desire everything that God has for you, you want, you want the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, it's time to let go. It's time to say, Lord, I want more. More of Jesus, less of me. By His power, I will be. Like a flower in the spring, brand new life in everything. I want more. More of Jesus. More of Jesus. The Apostle Paul said, I must decrease so that he can increase in me. Come on, if you want more as we end the service worshiping, let that be your heart's cry, I want more. Jesus, I need more, more of you. Oh, praise you, Jesus. As we worship the Lord, let's, let's enter into his presence. If you have never been filled with the Holy Spirit, but you desire everything God has for you, it's one thing to, to ask Jesus to save you, but there's more for you. He wants to baptize you in his Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I come to baptize you in my spirit. If you desire the Holy Spirit today, or you desire more of His Spirit, I want to, I want to invite you to come, because He has more for you. Let's enter into the presence of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. More of Jesus, less of me. By your power, Lord, I will be like a flower in the spring, brand new life in everything. More, more of you, Jesus. If you desire more of Jesus, why don't you come? More of Jesus. Come on, everybody, anybody that you just desire more of Jesus, you're not satisfied, come around this altar. Come around this altar. If you're able, come around this altar. Let's fill this altar up with praise to the Lord. If you desire more of Him, cry out and say, Lord, I want more. Jesus, I need more. Lord, baptize me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me up with your Holy Spirit. Lord God, I need more. If this is your heart's cry, don't sit in your seat. Get up and come to this altar. Let's fill this altar. I need more, God. I need more. Lord, I'm not satisfied. I need more of you, Lord. I'm going to go down here to the altar because I need more of Jesus. I'm not satisfied. I need more of his Holy Spirit. I need you, Lord. 
Lord God, we need you. Come on, if the Holy Spirit's talking to you, if you're not satisfied, if you're not satisfied, if you need more.